With an ever-evolving style and format, it's fitting that the Scooby-Doo series continually goes back to crossovers. From superhero-style team-ups, entire shows dedicated to pop culture guests, and some obscure and forgotten pieces of media that may genuinely shock you to find out, this is a review of every piece of Scooby-Doo crossover media. Yeah, this is Billiam. <laughs> It's taken me a really long time to truly appreciate Scooby-Doo. When I started making videos about Scooby-Doo on this channel, I really just wanted to appreciate the Scooby-Doo I remember growing up with. But as I continue to watch more and more, I start to just truly and deeply appreciate the charm of Scooby-Doo. I am done defending Scrappy. Now I want to review every single piece of Scooby-Doo crossover media. I originally envisioned this big video as a third Scooby-Doo marathon, but instead I just want to do one big super Scooby-Doo special because he's special. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and format it like an iceberg. If you're not familiar with an iceberg chart, an iceberg chart is like a graph meme that organizes information to the most well-known info to the most obscure, going deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole with each layer. So I'm going to organize this video similarly, but not exactly. Layer one will be a review of all of the Scooby-Doo shows that have had guest stars and crossover appearances from other characters. Layer two will be about all of the straight-to-video Scooby-Doo films featuring guest stars and crossover characters. Layer 3 will be an overview of other TV shows that have featured Scooby-Doo characters officially as guest stars. And finally, Layer 4 will be about all of the terrifying, obscure Scooby-Doo crossover media that you may or may not have heard of and perhaps will shock you. Strap in and be warned, it's the Super Scooby-Thon. Oh boy. The holidays are coming up and I'm feeling very scared, not just because of all the ghouls and spooks, but because I gotta start saving money to buy presents for my loved ones. I should cut back on my purchases or start purchasing a lot more thanks to today's sponsor, Upside. Upside gets me cash back for spending money? That's certainly a trick that gets you a lot of treats. It's true. Upside offsets inflated prices by offering you cash back on purchases. They partner with local businesses, kind of like a loyalty card or a rewards program, but with Upside, you earn up to three times as much cash back. You even get rewarded for doing chores, like going to get gas or groceries. You just claim the offer like I am here with getting gas. I just claim the offer to get what I need. Cash back? on gas? That's incredible. There are also multiple ways you can get your cash back delivered through PayPal, Amazon gift cards, or other e-branded gift cards, or you can just get it directly deposited into your bank account. Boom. To get started, download Upside from either the App Store or Google Play Store and use code Billiam to get an additional $5 off of your first purchase of $10 or more. Thank you, Upside, and thank you to the audience for watching. Despite Scooby's everlasting presence in pop culture, it's kind of surprising to see that no one Scooby-Doo show in particular lasted too long. The original show, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You?, only ran for two seasons, 25 episodes, and it was canceled for two years before it came back. In 1972, Scooby-Doo made his return to CBS with the new Scooby-Doo movies, which famously features a famous guest star in every episode, both fictional characters and non-fiction people. Phyllis Diller looks like a fictional person. They're called the new Scooby-Doo movies because unlike all of the other Scooby-Doo shows, which have been 10 to 20 minutes long, these are 40 minutes each. Often when airing in syndication, these episodes would air in two parts and have syndication exclusive to be continued and previously on segments to bookend them. Being so long, I was really expecting these episodes to drag, but they really didn't too much. I watched a lot of Scooby-Doo straight to video movies growing up and those were longer than these. It just gives them more breath to tell their mystery story. I just love all of the visual humor of Hanna-Barbera animation, as well as the gang's cute jokes written within the dialogue. Like, never mind the head, look at the bread. <gasps> This is classic Scooby-Doo doing what Scooby-Doo does best in Scooby's early classic run. I was introduced to most of the pop culture figures featured in the new Scooby-Doo movies through Scooby-Doo. Even now, I don't think I've seen many of them in anything else. I think the person who's most well-known for being a guest star on Scooby-Doo is Don Knotts, who would actually go on to have a pretty robust voice acting career later in life. Knotts famously played Barney Fife, the deputy sheriff on The Andy Griffith Show, a sort of inept police officer. When Scooby sees Don Knotts at the beginning of the episode, no one in the gang believes him. Don Knotts in a place like this 
Never. They're running into monsters and celebrities every week, but they can't believe Scooby. So the gang gets stuck in a house and Don Knotts spends the whole episode essentially trolling them. While the gang barely notices that they're all him. You're fantastic. I kind of vibe with the gang having to get out of like an escape room situation rather than having to unmask a villain in this one. Amazing. Too much talent for one man. Don Knotts would return again in a later episode where he and the gang finally get acquainted. They never find out it's him in the first one. Don Knotts would reprise this role in the video game Scooby-Doo Night of 100 Frights. He gives you the instructions before the level. He sort of become the face of these pop culture icons who have been in Scooby-Doo. With a lot of later Hanna-Barbera cartoons having him on as a guest role. The ladies love the makeovers. But the ladies already love Johnny. <laughs> and even What's New Scooby-Doo drawing a caricature of him for one of the characters. Doing some research, it was pretty quick to piece together why many of these celebrities in particular were on the new Scooby-Doo movies. They all have a connection to CBS, which was the network Scooby-Doo originally aired on. Dick Van Dyke and Tim Conway were on The Carol Burnett Show. The Sandy Duncan Show started airing a year before. The Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour aired a year before. Jonathan Winters hosted The Jonathan Winter Show. Cass Elliott of the Mamas and the Papas hosted several TV events for CBS. Same for country singer Jerry Reed. Monkeys vocalist Davy Jones is there because CBS started airing reruns of the Monkeys TV show at this time. I also don't think I need to explain the presence of many Hanna-Barbera characters in these crossovers. Speed Buggy, the weird talking car and clone of Scooby-Doo makes an appearance. Scooby-Doo is afraid of him. Famous Speed Buggy. Uh-huh, uh, that's me. How are you, Scooby-Doo? <laughs> Genie and Babu, I thought these were the same characters as like I Dream of Genie, but it's not. And then there's Josie and the Pussycats. Also, none of the Scooby gang has a problem saying the name Dick Van Dyke 500 times. Dick Van Dyke! But not one of them will utter the complete name of Josie and the Pussycats. Not once. Josie and the gang. These are the pussycats. Oh, wow. Hey, your group really floors me. I also found it pretty interesting that both the Three Stooges and Laurel and Hardy were not based off of the original people. Rather, these were actually crossovers with the Hanna-Barbera shows that just used their likeness. In fact, before this, Laurel and Hardy, the famous vaudeville comedy duo, controversially had the rights to the characters taken away from the families right before Hanna-Barbera made the cartoon. It's controversial because Laurel and Hardy were actually dead. The most frequent guest stars in Scooby-Doo were the Harlem Globetrotters. The all-trick, fancy moves, basketball, showy team. While there are a few guests that appear more than once, the only guests to appear three times were the Harlem Globetrotters, who also had a Hanna-Barbera produced cartoon. The Harlem Globetrotters are like a basketball team. They're like the Cirque du Soleil of basketball, doing all sorts of crazy tricks and maneuvers to always win against the other team. Okay. Who would win in a legitimate match, any one NBA team, or the Harlem Globetrotters allowed to use all their tricks? Like, sure, maybe the NBA can face off against a few of their tricks, but what are they gonna do when the guy slam dunks from the top of a skyscraper? One of the Harlem Globetrotters did that. I have to admit, by the third crossover episode, all the basketball shenanigans were like, come on, just... Come on, let's hurry it up. I was also surprised to learn that the Batman in the crossover episodes isn't Adam West's Batman. It's the Batman from Hanna-Barbera's Super Friends. I watched this one a lot because of the Scooby-Doo meets Batman video. And I know a lot of people watched the Harlem Globetrotters one because that one also had its own dedicated release. It's just such a weird nostalgia watching this. I'll always remember Robin blindfolding the gang before taking them to the Batcave and Batman's Bat Cookies. Yes, Shaggy, we'll all have a snack. Bat milk and cookies for everyone. Bat milk? He's in a second episode and he remembers Scooby and the gang and he's happy to give Scooby more bat cookies. He's like, of course I have them, Scooby-Doo. The Joker and the Penguin just f***ing with everyone in the funhouse. It's classic. The feeble-minded fools. Do they think a rolling tire can upset us? <laughs> 
Funny enough, for the longest time, Hanna-Barbera and Warner Brothers was unable to release a complete DVD collection. Even the most recent collection is called the Almost Complete Collection. They had trouble getting the rights for the Addams Family. The episode is Wednesday is Missing. The gang is left to babysit the Addams Family kids. Wednesday goes missing, and they're afraid of the monstrous consequences. I can't really find exactly what the dispute is with this episode, but for some reason, it hasn't been signed off to release. It will air on Boomerang occasionally, so it's not really lost media. But even this crossover isn't so random. About a year later, the Addams Family would premiere a Hanna-Barbera produced animated series that would last just a little bit. So this was clearly tying into that. Though they do have most of the original Addams Family cast in the Scooby-Doo crossover, even though they're not in the TV show. With the notable exception being Pugsley's actor, who's played by no-named... Oscar award winning actress Jodie Foster. Yes, I said that, that that is Jodie Foster. <laughs> I had a blast watching all of these. The comedy and stories and all of Scooby's whodunit plots are charming to no end. It's not ending. And I'll always be in love with the classic Hanna-Barbera look. There's a quality to early Scooby-Doo cartoons that just can't be replicated. I appreciate the original cartoons so much. The wide framing gives the action such a great comedic quality. I also love the variety of vocal performances contrasting with the guests. It's fun listening to them give voice acting their best shot against the classic performances of all the Scooby-Doo characters. Finish saying your prayer, Scooby? Uh-huh. Comment question. What god does Scooby-Doo pray to? Do all dogs go to heaven? Better check the scripture on that one. Like, look at Fred and Hardy beat up this monster. Fred is swinging his arms. The shoulders are just the axis point. Fred's also weirdly sexist in this one. It's like a consistent quality of his, but it balances out because he sucks at driving. This desert reminds me of a woman. Why is that? It goes on and on and on. <laughs> Man. Fred? <laughs> Comment question. What does Shaggy need uranium for? Say, Sheriff, would it be okay if I took home this little bag of uranium as a souvenir? Why, sure, son. Here, hold this uranium. Delighted. Now, since the new Scooby-Doo movies, the guest star role has just become a part of the series' DNA, with multiple episodes of multiple Scooby shows featuring guest stars. Now, I've reviewed the shows in which these episodes appeared, so I'm not going to talk about them for too long. There are a few that appear outside of the shows where the gimmick is having a guest star every episode. The What's New Scooby-Doo episode, Diamonds Are a Ghoul's Best Friend, features NHL player Brett Hull. I think you can guess who's in Simple Plan and the Invisible Madman. Steve Harwell from Smash Mouth also makes an appearance. And in the Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated episode, the Mystery Solvers State Finals, we get a crossover team up with Scooby-Doo and all of the characters that were ripping off Scooby-Doo. I'm sorry, Fred, but we can't go to the finals with Scooby sick like this. Oh, right. No, of course not. Will you excuse me a second? Scooby has a fever, so they have to miss this, like, high school-sponsored event, the Mystery Solvers State Finals. In Scooby's fever dream, he and all the other show mascots have to save their group of teenage mystery solvers who've been kidnapped and apparently turned into gerbils. Jabberjaw, the Funky Phantom, Captain Caveman, Speed Buggy, they're all here. But it turns out the Funky Phantom is behind it all. My heart is racing. I can't breathe. I'm going down. <laughs> Ooh, he's hyperventilating, don't you know? Scooby-Doo Mystery Inc. has a great outlook on Scooby-Doo's history and even features a tongue-in-cheek crossover with the Blue Falcon and Dynomutt. We'll be talking about them a whole lot more later in the video when we talk about Scoob as well as the programming blocks Scooby-Doo and Dynomutt used to share. Dynomutt is like this silly comedic relief type character who's paired with the Blue Falcon, who's also sort of a parody of all all of the really boring superhero characters created by Hanna-Barbera. In Mystery Incorporated, the Blue Falcon has become this old, disgruntled, Dark Knight kind of character. But what's amazing about this crossover is they keep Dynamut the exact same character, so they contrast all of this, like, brutal action with, like, silly Hanna-Barbera sound effects. I'm gonna help you shed your skin, Snake. One scale at a time. Ooh, the 
me help you with that, BF? With my handy dandy fishing magician. But as much as I love What's New Scooby-Doo and Mystery Incorporated, there's something lost when these shows are storyboarded and framed like they're an action show. I believe so much of the appeal of Scooby-Doo comes from the direct, head-on, wide, sitcom-style framing. So when I read an interview with showrunner Chris Bailey, who developed the most recent Scooby-Doo series, Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, on Scoobypedia, I was excited to hear about his philosophy for why it's important for Scooby-Doo and Guess Who to be rooted in the visual identity of classic Scooby-Doo. The gang's iconic run cycles, the endlessly long hallways, the darker color palettes, and the heavy reliance on slapstick visual humor all come together very well to create what I really feel like is the first very faithful modern Scooby-Doo TV show. And to continue to play tribute to that classic formula, every single episode features a guest star. But I think since this show aired 50 years after Scooby-Doo was created, as opposed to two years after Scooby-Doo was created, that a lot of the celebrity appearances seem to have more of an appreciation for what they're being a part of. There's also the fun added element with all of the celebrity Celebrity guests also being a suspect. It is not infrequent for the monster to get unmasked and the guest star to be the one behind it. With 52 episodes, we see a lot of modern and slightly dated pop culture figures like Urkel. Like Urkel. This zany side character who turned Family Matters, a normal ass sitcom, into like a science fiction cartoon. <laughs> And now he's like an actual cartoon. That's very fitting. They actually get Jaleel White back to voice him. Is he your favorite Sonic the Hedgehog? Or did you prefer him more as Manic the Hedgehog? Or Sonya the Hedgehog? <laughs> Yeah, Urkel's a little dated and I've seen people raise an eyebrow to that, but you're just completely ignoring the fact that Laurel and Hardy were dead when Scooby-Doo crossed over with them. He crossed over to the other side. The first episode features basketball player Chris Paul, who's in a golf tournament and he's trying to win the golf tournament to raise funds for this like youth program he's doing so he can help people learn to bowl. Let me get this right. Basketball legend and assist king Chris Paul is playing in a golf tournament to save an art school so he can teach him bowling? Now you're getting it. But there's other athletes like Terry Bradshaw and Layla Ali, Chloe Kim, and my personal athletic hero, Joey Chestnut, the glizzy king, <laughs> just eating hot dogs. This man literally has a world record for eating like 60 hot dogs in three seconds. Not that much, but I don't want to look up the math. I appreciate his humbleness because he allows both Scooby and Shaggy to beat him in an eating contest two times in the episode. So like, thank you. And then Jim Gaffigan, he like hates eating eating with Shaggy and Scooby. They keep ri racing to the next fast food place and when they eat before the other one, they get mad at each other. Shaggy and Scooby are so excited to see Alton Brown that they're not even afraid of anything. They're just excited for the food. But we also have so many music stars like Sia, Halsey, Macklemore, Casey Musgraves, Joseph Simmons from Run DMC, Axl Rose. Apparently he won't get in a room with Slash, but he loves Scooby-Doo. Keenan Thompson just loves writing jokes with Shaggy and Scooby because they make him laugh. There's a Ricky Gervais episode. It's mid. Weird Al makes a great appearance. He's running an accordion camp that Scooby and Shaggy want to attend. There's always the joke in the episode that one of the members of the gang has like a really deep rooted relationship with the guest star of the episode. It's always funny to find out what that is. Like Lucy Lou and Scooby Doo used to have an art class together. There's also like a few just whacked guest stars. Sherlock Holmes is a guest star in one episode, but it's not Sherlock Holmes. It's just like a crazy British man on the street who like thinks he's Sherlock Holmes. And then one episode guest star is like titled to be the ghost of Abraham Lincoln, but the guest stars of the episode are actually the cast of the Funky Phantom. He's back. He turned out to be behind the mystery in Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, and he's behind the mystery in this episode too. Well, actually he's not. He plays the ghost of Abraham Lincoln to get both gangs to get together and solve the mystery together. I just love how the cast of the Funky Phantom, besides the Funky Phantom himself, are, are also just like portrayed as assholes. <laughs> Looking for clues. I got a clue for ya. Go home. Like, I don't think Warner Brothers are looking to make another funky Phantom show. So the writers were free to do whatever they wanted and they hate the Scooby gang. I I've just become a big 
fan of the Funky Phantom. Every time he speaks, I have a smile on my face. Boo, I used to have a sword just like this. Dynamut and the Blue Falcon also make a much more classic appearance. Magilla Gorilla, another Hanna-Barbera character makes an appearance. Wanda Sykes starts working at the pet shop where he lives and the owner, Mr. Peebles, from the original show, is arrested. And finally, the finale for Magilla Gorilla that nobody's been waiting for comes when Wanda Sykes adopts Magilla Gorilla. Morgan Freeman narrates a lot of the episode where he's a guest star. I was confused to see Lord of the Rings actor Sean Astin, but fun fact, his adoptive father also appeared in Scooby-Doo, John Astin. He's Gomez Adams. And also, beautifully, Scooby-Doo's current voice cast also makes an appearance as themselves. Scooby and the gang go to visit Frank Welker's house and all of the classic villains start coming out of the shadows and kidnapping all of the actors. And it turns out that all four of the actors are dressed up as all four of the villains in the episode. As a way to highlight all of their creative talent, each one of the actors goes on to explain that they wanted to kidnap each other so they could take on their voiceover roles because of how much they admire each other. It's very sweet. And just once I wanted to play the role that Matt plays. I wanted to be the goofball knucklehead the one who doesn't have to do anything serious that would be so easy uh it's a lot harder than it looks gray <laughs> the batman crossover features a more serious batman what did you do with alfred we didn't do anything with mr pennyworth honest kevin conroy comes back to voice him and mark hamill comes back to voice the joker who is revealed to be behind everything at the end of the episode they get involved with this batman mystery because daphne's uncle alfred batman's butler has been kidnapped there's some great visual gags in this episode i love when fred and the rest of the gang are going around wayne manor and just naturally fred discovers some of the secret switches that lead into the secret batman rooms like that that's what they do. But besides Batman returning, there's also a fun crossover with Wonder Woman where the gang actually has to try to save the monster because Wonder Woman wants to kill it. And I love the beautifully written crossover with The Flash, One Minute Mysteries. It's like a Scooby-Doo what if where we revisit a lot of their classic mysteries from the original show and we show how quickly they could have solved it if The Flash was there. Now let's see who this ghost of Captain Cutler really is. It's also fun to see what bits the new guest stars fall into that exist within the Scooby gang already. Layla Ali tells Shaggy to be brave. And like Jeff Foxworthy tries to convince Fred he's a country boy. A little bit of country in him. Gosh, how would I know for sure? Well, have you ever had to move a transmission so you could take a bath? Sure, the bathtub is the perfect place to strip and re-gear a transmission. Definitely a country boy. <laughs> the guest stars that I really found myself appreciating, however, were the guest stars who were also in the new Scooby-Doo movies. Both Cher and Sandy Duncan make an appearance in both series. And the Sandy Duncan episode in Guess Who is framed as a bad remake of the original. But the final guest for Scooby-Doo and guess who is Carol Burnett, which is just such a fitting and well-deserved guest spot for her after both Tim Conway and Dick Van Dyke's appearance. Maybe she was a little too big for Scooby-Doo back in the day, but now Scooby-Doo's big enough for her. Tier two, Scooby-Doo movies. <laughs> Dig this, yappy dog. We'll handle all the creepy villain angles on this network. Well, yappy dog. <laughs> Since 1999, Scooby-Doo has either had one or two direct-to-video releases every single year. With nearly 40 titles in its catalog, it's no wonder that many of these are crossover films. But I kind of like the fact that they still make Scooby-Doo films. When all of the shows are trying out different formulas, they have this consistent release every single year that pays tribute to traditional Scooby-Doo. So it's like, if you don't like whatever gimmicky thing they're doing, they have like two great feature length episodes every year. And I think the longer format does work all right for Scooby-Doo, as it does for many mystery shows. If Sherlock can be an hour and a half, Scooby-Doo can be an hour 10. So the first direct-to-video Scooby-Doo film to be a crossover was from 2012, Scooby-Doo and the Mask of the Blue Falcon. This one's kind of a compliment to the Mystery Inc. episode because it's not really about the Blue Falcon, rather the Adam West type character who used to play the Blue Falcon. He's feeling lost in the spirit.
spotlight as everybody starts looking towards the new edgier Blue Falcon reboot. Scooby and Shaggy like the classic Blue Falcon, but Fred's all about the edgier one. The Masked Monster in this movie is also a callback to Scooby and Dino Mutt's crossovers of the past, Mr. Hyde. It's also filled with a lot of different Hanna-Barbera references, but I do kind of wish the Hanna-Barbera world could exist alongside Scooby-Doo instead of being like the major fandom in the show. But that's also kind of funny. It's kind of funny that everybody in the Scooby-Doo world is really into Hanna-Barbera properties. I find it hard to really critique a lot of these later Scooby-Doo films because I think the quality is pretty consistent, but there are some standout ones. So this one's just kind of like your average Scooby-Doo film. Next from 2014, we have Scooby-Doo and the WrestleMania mystery. For the longest time, this was the first and only clip I ever saw from it. <laughs> This was really weird when it came out, not only because it was the first Scooby crossover to be done with a not like Warner Brothers owned property in a very long time, but because alongside this film also came like Flintstones, Stone Age Smackdown, another crossover with the WWE, and like the only piece of Flintstones media that's been created in like 20 years. So Scooby and the gang find themselves in WWE City, a place that would never exist exist in real life. There's the best wrestler hotel, McMahon's Waffle House, the Sleeper Hold Hotel. I would never stay here because the entire time I would be in WWE City, I'd just be waiting for somebody to come up from behind me and like hit me with a chair. So they team up with John Cena and all the other available wrestlers to take down this spooky bear monster. He keeps going around beating up all the wrestlers. So I don't know too much about wrestling, so I didn't exactly click with this one as much as a wrestling fan may have. But once again, these films have a consistent quality. It was fun. Fuck that McMahon guy though. So next from 2015, we have Scooby-Doo and Kiss, rock and roll mystery. Okay, so I recently saw This Is Guar screen at the Florida Film Festival. I understood that Guar as a band had this like epic cosmic backstory, but I guess I never clicked that they were kind of making fun of Kiss and like other like hair metal bands. But I've now learned from this Scooby-Doo movie that Kiss actually has this like crazy go nuts lore, but I only know about it because of Scooby-Doo. So like Kiss the band comes from this magical planet called Kisteria and they guard the source of ultimate power in the universe, the Rock of Kisteria, but this evil sorceress, she wants the Rock of Kisteria. Also, if you look like this, call me. Kiss the band, they, they transform like Sailor Moon into their super powered forms and use rock and roll to defeat evil. And their base of operations is outside of a theme park that would never exist in real life. Kiss World. Would you rather go to Kiss World or WWE City? As a brand packaged into a band, Kiss and Scooby-Doo vibe really well together. One thing I've started to notice about all of these movies is usually every single one has a plot line about the whole gang being into whatever specific thing the movie is about, except for like one member. Guess who doesn't like Kiss? It's Fred. Fred hates Kiss. He likes his doo-wop band, the Ascot Five. He's not gonna take it. He can bench 220. I'm training to bench 220. One. But eventually, like all of these movies has that member of the gang coming around and learning to see what the others appreciate about whatever thing they're into. Is that makeup? It's a moon. Whoa. Who hit you, buddy? No one. Looks like a black eye. It's not. Nice shiner. It's a moon. Please, you seem like a nice boy. Go stand with your friends. Why would he even try anymore after that? He tries so hard and you all make him feel bad. It's probably because of all that sexist bullshit he used to say. Women. <gasps> what am I saying? I'm one of them. That's how deep you affected them, Fred. They started saying sexist stuff about themselves. I'm your biggest fan, Fred, but we have to address the elephants in the room. Actually, I love the way you say treasure. There's just one elephant in the room. And they're carrying treasures from the pyramid. Before the treasures are smuggled out of the country, a 
stolen treasure. And the very next year in 2016, we had Scooby-Doo in the WWE Curse of the Speed Demon. It's a second WWE crossover, mostly with a different array of wrestlers. It's cute that Shaggy and Scooby are afraid of The Undertaker, but also love him. I also know just enough about the WWE to both suspect and then find it funny when it's revealed that Triple H and Stephanie McMahon are behind the Speed Demon monster. Like, that's, that's silly. Triple H is a character with a long history of heel turns, and Stephanie McMahon is the spoiled brat daughter of Vince McMahon. No duh, they're evil. And just two years later, we had Scooby-Doo and Batman, the brave and the bold. It's fun to know that the connection between Batman and Scooby-Doo has continued to be acknowledged as a profitable venture for both brands. This is a fun movie. Also, James Gunn, the writer of both live-action Scooby-Doo movies, recently got put in charge of DC. If we were ever gonna get a live-action Scooby-Doo Batman crossover, it's gonna be right now. Like, I could see both George Clooney's Batman and Robert Pattinson's Batman meeting the Scooby gang. Or you could just have, like, Will Arnett put on the Val Kilmer Batman costume again and interact with them. As a show, Batman the Brave and the Bold is like an all-out celebration of Batman's more colorful history, standing kind of in stark contrast to Batman's more popular, recent depiction as a more serious, brooding hero. Of course, Scooby-Doo is a bright part of that colorful history. In this movie, basically all of Batman's rogues gallery makes a little appearance here. I f hard with this Joker design. <laughs> I really like Batman seeking the Scooby gang out for once. It puts pressure on them to succeed and gives them somebody to look up to. In a really fun finale, the whole Scooby gang dresses up as the Bat family, including Scooby as Bat the Ace Hound. They have to go in to rescue Batman. But one little detail about this film that just makes me go, Huh? The final villain of the film ends up being Clayface, a Batman villain that can change his appearance magically to look like anyone. Uh, I meant to say science fictionally. All of these Scooby-Doo movies recently have been so hesitant to allow actual like paranormal stuff to come into the show. Like Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island didn't have real zombies. But why can Clayface exist in the universe, but not real zombies and cat people? Like where do you draw that line? Then released the very same year, like. Like it's a boys and girls McDonald's toy. We have Scooby-Doo and the Gourmet Ghost. If you weren't into Batman, you could have the Food Network one. So in this one, Scooby and the gang meet Bobby Flay, who's Fred's uncle. I guess that makes me like him more. Shaggy immediately just ask him for like Beef Wellington. How embarrassing for Fred. Where Scooby-Doo meets the Pawn Stars or Scooby-Doo meets the Property Brothers. Scooby-Doo meets the Pawn Stars would be so f Awesome. <laughs> Bobby Flay stood on Morimoto's cutting board and Morimoto said he's not a chef. Why are we even acknowledging this guy still? Where's Scooby-Doo meets Guy Fieri? Guy Fieri, he doesn't like beg people to come to him so he can be all cool and whatever. He goes out into the country himself and he goes to all of these family restaurants so he can appreciate them. Don't you think that vibes more with Shaggy and Scooby? I would love to see Shaggy and Scooby get all grubby with them and like, you know, that's a more fitting crossover. Fred and Guy, they could race in their cars. Daphne can be the one who's not into him because he doesn't. she doesn't really like how he eats with like his fingers all the time. But at the end, she learns to appreciate his food wisdom. Comment question, why does Daphne hate Guy Fieri? And what makes her learn to appreciate him? What other things does the whole Scooby gang appreciate except for one member? Comment below. So anyways, this movie features Scooby and the gang finding Food Network Academy, I guess. What the f is with all these places that just wouldn't exist. Like where are all the giant stalactite mines underneath every single city? So Bobby Flay and the gang need to solve the mystery behind the red ghost who's haunting the manor. It's the real estate agent. They got his ass. Scoob. 2020. Like, I'm reviewing Scoob in 2022. <laughs> Scoob from 2020 is the most recent big budget splash made by the Scooby Doo brand. It's the first feature film since 2004's Scooby Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. This film was released early during lockdown when a lot of studios were experimenting with like premium rentals for films that were originally planned for theatrical release but had that release canceled. The story sees Scooby Doo and Shaggy feeling unneeded by the the gang when special guest Simon Cowell from Far Far Away Idol, I presume. It's me, everyone. 
For what is a man? Refuses to invest in a recently incorporated mystery incorporated. So Shaggy and Scooby-Doo are picked up by the Blue Falcon and Dynomutt while they're being pursued by a group of vicious scorpion robots. Feeling empowered by being recognized by their favorite superhero, Shaggy and Scooby find their friendship tested as they come against their most dangerous villain yet, Dick f***ing Dastardly from Wacky Races. Usually he has a dog that goes, <laughs> I watched this movie originally when it came out and I wanted to do a review, but I kind of had trouble connecting with it on like any level. There are so many properties being rebooted and reimagined that this one just sort of got like mixed in it with me. But upon watching it again, I I'm feeling a little bit more positive towards it, but I do have my bigger critiques. I really hate that the gang is separated so early on. Yeah, you do have like the opening of the movie where they're all kids, but the actual story for most of the film sees the gang separated from each other. I do think most of the casting is passable. Fred, Daphne, and and Velma just sound like a different version of the characters. But Will Forte as Shaggy is just not there. It's in the uncanny valley of Shaggy voices where he's clearly doing an impression, but he's not landing it. Shaggy and Scooby are our best friends. Yeah, and like, what's more valuable than friendship? If you were gonna cast Will Forte, you should have just let him be Will Forte. Or they could have got somebody who could actually do the Shaggy voice. Like, is Will Forte like any level of famous more than Matthew Lillard? Like. 3% more famous maybe? But then I think Shaggy's voice is just as iconic as Scooby's. They're a comedy duo. They keep Frank Welker's voice as Scooby-Doo. They should have also kept Shaggy's voice. And you know what? Why not just keep everyone's voice? I also didn't immediately recognize Ken Jeong as being a miscast when I watched the movie initially. I was too focused on Mark Wahlberg playing the son of the Blue Falcon, Brian. At first I thought he was kind of the weak link in this duo, but they they should have kept Dynomutt's original voice and kept the same dynamic they wrote for the movie with Dynomutt taking on the more serious role with the new Blue Falcon being young and inexperienced. It would be so funny to have Dynomutt with the same silly voice getting irritated at Brian. <laughs> that's not the Blue Falcon, that's just Brian. Like to me, Dynomutt is a character like Scooby-Doo where his character has to be the original version. But Blue Falcon Falcon is kind of like a parody of boring superheroes. It could be anyone. It would just be so cute to have that original voice without the goofball personality, like he's all grown up now. It's also disappointing because when this movie was originally announced, it was conceptualized as a much more robust crossover featuring a wider variety of Hanna-Barbera characters. Prominently. Penelope Pitstop, Jabberjaw, Grape Ape. Its scope was kind of scaled down and it feels like they did it so they could start up a franchise. Why do all of these like franchise films think they gotta start with the Iron Man 2 of their franchise? Dee Dee Sykes from Captain Caveman and the Teen Angels is Blue Falcon's assistant in this movie and they actually discover the prehistoric world where Captain Caveman comes from and he has an extended cameo in the film. But if you look like this, f***ing call me. There was no guarantee that this film was going to have a sequel even if it was a theatrical release. So I wish they just went ahead and did the balls to the walls version they were originally planning. It's just another title in Scooby-Doo's big catalog of films now when it could have been like a big exciting adventure. Like to me, there's no reason why this story couldn't have been any of the other Scooby-Doo movies. I mean like they meet Batman, is that any different? different than the Blue Falcon. Though I think the fact that it is just another title in all of these films and it is so different is kind of why I'm able to appreciate it now. I do feel like the character animation in Scoob is really commendable. They really nailed down the feeling of these characters in an animated form. I think the third act is really well done. I think Dick Dastardly is a very fun choice for a villain who we all wanna see him get reunited with because even if you don't really know who Dick Dastardly is, you know, the image of the two of them together. He's just a guy who likes his dog, even if he is a bastard. Also, all the dick jokes, great trailer material. Rick with a D. Duh, 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 dick. Well, 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 Rick. Dick, dick, dick! But they still won't let the gang say Josie and the p 
Copycats. Next, released the very same year as Scoob, we have Happy Halloween, Scooby-Doo. This is a Scooby-Doo film that I think a lot more people should have paid attention to, but I think interest in it was kind of diluted because of Scoob. I mean, all two people who had high expectations for Scoob, me and that guy on Instagram who literally responds Scooby-Doo to every single one of my posts. He only gave up a few months ago. You broke my heart. This video's for you. This movie is written by Maxwell Adams, the creator of the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy, one of Cartoon Network's darker, weirder shows. I love it. And you could certainly see his influence here all comfortably within the world of Scooby-Doo. That's the Grim Reaper on the car. <laughs> the plot is bonkers. On Halloween night, Scooby and the gang interrupt a parade while trying to solve a mystery. There's all these drones flying around Crystal Cove. And when they unmask the guy behind it, they find out it's Scarecrow from Batman. Like literally Scarecrow from Gotham City running into the Scooby gang. No Batman in sight. He's straight up just in a Scooby-Doo story. I love how they play within the toy box they're given. So Scarecrow, he insists he's being framed and he's arrested. And after he's arrested, everybody in town starts turning into zombie pumpkins. They're flying around everywhere. After the mystery machine is destroyed, the gang and a few others get chased out of town by a convoy of evil pumpkin headed zombies driving cars. Along for the ride is Elvira, explained to have been hosting the Halloween party interrupted by Scooby and the gang's mystery. And Bill Nye, who acts as the guy in the chair for the gang as they ride in their newly provided high-tech mystery machine X. Fred hates it. This thing has it all. Except a soul. This one is a blast with fast paced action and a humor and wonderful guest star interactions. What do you think, Mr. Nye? Do you have any science-based wisdom to impart? Well, Velma, if you stacked every ruler on Earth end to end between the Earth and the moon, they would all drift away before you could measure anything at all. That is such a cracked out answer from Bill Nye and a wonderful parody of pop science. All the character writing is spot on too. Maxwell Adams chooses to keep Daphne's weirder personality from Be Cool Scooby-Doo, as well as her martial arts training from the live action movie. She's still got a little Sarah Michelle Gellar in her. And then the final battle with the gang smashing all of the pumpkins alongside the final reveal of the villain being the sheriff who has this like parasocial relationship with the gang. I feel almost like you're the only family I've got. But we've only talked like eight or ten times. Is just hilarious. He's a very funny character. Overall, this is probably my highest recommendation on this list. I love Scarecrow as a red herring. I love the humor. I love Scooby-Doo. And finally, from 2021, we have straight out of nowhere, Scooby-Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog. I'm so exhausted by brand synergy that I really overlooked this when it came out last year. But when I finally got to sit down and watch it, it, it's great. It's a wonderful celebration of Courage the Cowardly Dog, and it's not something I really knew I wanted until I saw it. I think the best crossovers is when one property is firmly planted into the world of another. But with a lot of recent Scooby-Doo movies being hesitant to acknowledge anything supernatural existing in this world, I was kind of nervous to watch this because Courage the Cowardly Dog is exactly that weird paranormal bullshit. But indeed, Scooby-Doo goes straight straight into nowhere. While the gang is in the town closest to nowhere, the home of Courage the Cowardly Dog, Scooby and Courage both start hearing a strange frequency which brings them close together. The gang follows Scooby-Doo to the farmhouse where he meets Muriel and Eustace from Courage the Cowardly Dog. Muriel is so beautifully written, she doesn't really understand what the gang means when they tell her they go around solving mysteries. So she keeps giving them riddles, which isn't really their thing. It keeps frustrating Velma. I can't believe I don't know. Why, it's the stars, dear. The stars! Ah, uh, I can't believe I didn't get that! But Muriel is so sweet, she could never get mad. I also love when she offers Courage and Scooby her very sweet, homemade Courage snacks instead of Scooby snacks. But later on, she reveals that they're just store-bought and put into a little jar. It's also really special to hear Thea White as Muriel one last time so soon before she died. It would be very difficult to imagine any future Courage the Cowardly Dog projects without her. Eustace is just a shitbag as always. He has this funny little rap in the middle of the film where he talks about all these treasures he's recently gotten. 
but he just takes the opportunity to scare not only Courage, but Scooby and Shaggy for the entire film. Then he like insults Scooby and Shaggy's sandwich making skills. He's like, you're putting too much mustard on it. But in private, he's shameless to take their suggestion to put more mustard on the sandwich. I do think this movie was missing a dreadful ending for Eustace. So many Courage the Cowardly Dog episodes end with him like getting murdered or stuck in a dangerous situation as Muriel and Courage get out of it. Eustace needed to die in this movie like he does in so many episodes. And I am not cynical enough to have been immune from Courage, Shaggy, and Scooby all bonding over how cowardly they all are. They listen to a self-help book together, and by the end of the film, they all realize that they're all brave because despite the fact that they're so afraid, they go and do the right thing anyways. Oh, and also, like, Scooby and Courage, whenever they hear that frequency that nobody else can hear, it's the little medley that plays from Courage the Cowardly Dog. Whenever Courage is going around trying to do stuff, the little do 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 and like seeing Courage and Scooby like dance to that song a little bit is so adorable. <laughs> in true mystery solving fashion, Scooby-Doo does in fact explain all of the weird stuff that happens in nowhere, but they don't explain it away. It just allows you to accept the Courage the Cowardly Dog show as it is. But what's kind of funny about this is I think this might be the last Scooby-Doo movie in this style. The most recent movie, Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo, uses the Scooby-Doo and Guess Who style. So in a funny way, this is like a finale. They figure out the supernatural does exist in nowhere. Going back and watching a lot of these Scooby-Doo movies that I've missed over the last 15 years, once again, I have been surprised to see the consistent quality. They're able to create fun side characters and fun mysteries for pretty much every single one of these. But I specifically appreciate two things. One, the baller intros every single one of these movies have. They go hard. And two, Fred's new catchphrase. Shaggy says zoinks, Daphne says jeepers, Velma says jinkies, Scooby says rutro, and Fred now says, hold the phone? Hold the phone! And how Freddy says, hold the phone! And what phone are you supposed to be holding exactly? It's kind of perfect. It's not too flashy. It's Fred. While I love other characters and celebrities stepping into Scooby-Doo's world, it's not uncommon for the opposite to happen. So for tier three, let's do something crazy and watch a bunch of other TV shows. The first TV show to ever feature Scooby-Doo characters as guests, to my knowledge, is Dino Mutt Dog Wonder. The show crossed over with the Scooby-Doo gang three separate times, all to promote a single hour-long programming block called the Scooby-Doo Dino Mutt Hour. I was kind of surprised to see that the show wasn't called The Blue Falcon. Dino Mutt is fearless, scareless, and a little too careless. He's fearless, scareless, a little too careless. Dino Mutt! He's a go-go dog person. That's what the theme tells us. So the Blue Falcon's sort of like a parody of all of the boring, very serious Hanna-Barbera superheroes of the time, like Birdman and Space Ghost. He's got every single pull out of his ass tool in his tool belt and his serious and heroic deep voice. What does it say, Dog Wonder? Uh, eat the rubber glove. But Dynamite's always messing things up. Uh -oh. Oops. <laughs> oh no. Another malfunction. It's cute that Dino Mutt calls Blue Falcon BF. It stands for Blue Falcon, obviously, but it just sounds like he's saying best friend. The first episode of Dino Mutt, Everybody Hide, features the Scooby gang and the Blue Falcon going after the evil Mr. Hyde. A different Mr. Hyde than Scooby and the gang previously faced huh? off against. Oh no! Who are you? What do you want? Your gold coins! This guy is awesome. Like, awesome in, as in full of... Ah, oh, like awful, awful. Stand in my way and this will be your fate. <laughs> no, please. Scooby-Doo and Dino Mutt really love each other and have like a little dog to dog respect for one another. Something that I think is really missing in Scoob. Dog Wonder will protect his canine cousin from the evil hive. 
But these aren't just like Scooby-Doo villains they gotta unmask. These are like real super villains, so they gotta get them. The second episode to feature these two cast together is What Now, Lowbrow, which features one of the most freakish villains I've ever seen, Lowbrow. This guy is incredible. He's like a stupid caveman type and he wants to be the king of crime. So he's gotta learn a bunch of stuff. Tries to apply to a university to see if he can get a degree in like running a criminal empire, but he's just turned away. I want to go to your school to learn how to be the best at pulling robberies. <gasps> Big City University doesn't teach robberies, sir. Oh yeah? Well, nobody can stop Lowbrow from learning how to be king of crime. So he goes to the school library and just steals a bunch of books thinking it will help him commit crimes. And it does. He opens a book and the first thing he sees is mm. skiing. This is the one. Bam, he uses it to commit a crime. This ski jump is my best crime idea yet. He opens another book. The first thing he sees is heavy machinery. Bam, he uses it to commit a crime. You literally can't give this guy any ideas. I mean, any ideas. He'll use it to pull a job. And then after Scooby and the gang helps Dynoma and Blue Falcon defeat Lowbrow, he treats them to a nice gourmet turkey dinner. He puts it on the Falcon card. There's also that one clip where he goes to the mall to like get a replacement part for Dynomutt. It's just like this department store happens to carry all the parts he needs for his like cyborg dog. Excuse me, his go-go dog person. This is like go-go gadget. It's not anything like <laughs> And finally, the episode The Wizard of the Ooze features another wonderful villain, Casey Kasim doing a strained Louisiana accent for this like rat guy. Look, I step on you if you don't get out of here. Scooby and the gang accidentally capture Blue Falcon while looking for a ghost. So they help Dynamut catch Swamp Rat by having Shaggy and Scooby dress up like the Blue Falcon and Dynamut. <laughs> Solid gold and the Fool Falcon miles away. <laughs> That's what you think, Swamp Rat. How'd you? You didn't count on the Falcon all-purpose disguise capsules, Swamp Rat. I mean, yeah, they probably wouldn't make this in a world like that. Swamp Rat. You're an idiot. Okay, this may be my personal favorite Scooby-Doo crossover. The Johnny Bravo episode, Bravo Dooby Doo. I watched this a lot because it was included as a special feature on the Scooby Doo Goes Hollywood video. So Johnny Bravo, the hunk, is hitchhiking on his way to his Aunt Jebedissa's house. His car breaks down when he's picked up by the Scooby Gang. The haunted aesthetic of Aunt Jebedissa's house entices them to investigate when Giga Gag Johnny Bravo gets mixed up in their typical antics. What makes this 11 minute cartoon so awesome is just like the spot on character comedy. Ah, uh, hold on, everybody. Alrighty. They write the Scooby Gang so well with a little wink and a nod, and they write Johnny Bravo so well. My glasses! I can't see without my glasses! My glasses! I can't be seen without my glasses! Which is wild because it was technically only like the third episode of Johnny Bravo. They always knew what Johnny Bravo was. I also just like the subtleness about the audience in joke humor. Like the idea that Fred and Daphne were ever an item was just something the audience would speculate on. Daphne? I mean, Scooby, you and Velma check upstairs and Fred and I look in the basement. Right, okay. This was the first time this was ever explicitly shown. <laughs> And like all the women who reject Johnny, once Aunt Jebedissa is revealed to be the monster, the gang rejects Johnny, tying him to a tree because Aunt Jebedissa calls him annoying. And he is. But Speed Buggy, just Speed Buggy, comes to help him out in the end. <laughs> It's just like a really nice celebration of Scooby-Doo when there wasn't a lot of Scooby-Doo media coming out. This came out in like the mid nineties. And it's a fun fitting nod from a Hanna-Barbera show that it saw itself as more modern to another classic show. Next from 2002 is Harvey Birdman, Shaggy Busted. To understand what Harvey Birdman is, I first have to kind of explain to you like Adult Swim's style in the late nineties and early two thousands. So a lot of Adult Swim content used 
used to be made for really cheap, and because of that, they would recycle and parody a lot of old Hanna-Barbera cartoons. Like Sea Lab 2020 became Sea Lab 2021, and many of the superhero shows like Space Ghost and Dino Boy became something completely different. Space Ghost became Space Ghost Coast to Coast. An improv celebrity interview series where Space Ghost, a cartoon, interviews celebrities. Hey, how are you, Ghost? I'm on the phone, that's how. Rude. In a kind of Eric Andre show way, everything's cut down to just have the funniest bits. And some of this stuff is just wild. <laughs> so following that train of thought, Harvey Birdman is also recycling old Hanna-Barbera characters. Harvey Birdman is originally from Birdman and the Galaxy Trio, an equally lame to Space Ghost Hanna-Barbera cartoon. But now Birdman has hung up his superhero ways to become a superhero attorney like She-Hulk and Daredevil. But instead of representing all the Marvel superheroes, Harvey Birdman represents the characters in his universe, the Hanna-Barbera universe. Fred Flintstone as Tony Soprano is one of the funniest things I've ever seen, mostly because I'm really into the Soprano Sopranos right now. We're gonna do it. So Shaggy is pulled over under the suspicion of smoking weed, and right off the bat, there's a great visual gag when the animation cuts to the real life dash cam pointed at the mystery machine. They're arrested, so Fred comes to Harvey Birdman for help. What I find very funny here is it's never explicitly stated that Shaggy does or doesn't smoke weed. Most of the suspicion just comes from his personality and the way many of the Scooby-Doo animation is drawn. They use a lot of awkward frames from the show as evidence of them being high. And then there's this beautiful moment. Get on, Scoob! <laughs> it just dawned on me, Scooby! Doobie! <laughs> like, if you go around the web, there's all of these wonderful, like, stoner parody shirts of Scooby-Doo and Shaggy, and they all have the same line. It says, somebody pass Shaggy a baggie so he can roll Scooby a doobie. You just see it everywhere with all these slightly different designs, some of which are just, like, the same exact design. Somebody pass Shaggy the baggie so he can roll Scooby a doobie. I would buy five of these shirts. They just weren't gonna arrive in time for the video. But Harvey's a good lawyer, and he's able to vouch for them. Who are we to look at these two fine young men and say, you there, I sit in judgment of you. I just love how they inherently know how funny these cartoons can be just off of the way they're drawn. It's such a loving roast. Next, we got Batman the Brave and the Bold, Bat Knight Presents, Batman's Strangest Cases, Season 2, Episode 25. So this episode of Batman is hosted by Batmite, a fifth dimensional being often depicted breaking the fourth wall to show his appreciation for the Batman universe. This episode is a bunch of different wacky Batman segments and ends with another crossover with the Scooby-Doo gang, featuring a surprise appearance from Weird Al. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. <laughs> Both of you. The highlight of this episode is when Batmite changes the universal rules of how the story was supposed to happen and allows both Batman and Shaggy to escape the custody of the villain just to like beat them up. Like Shaggy punching the Joker is a wild frame. Next from 2018, we have season 13, episode 16 of Supernatural, Scooby Natural. Okay, so for another video, I just watched one season of Supernatural, just the first season with the knowledge that I was about to skip ahead by 12 seasons to watch this Scooby-Doo crossover. Excellent crossover. I have no idea who Castiel is, but excellent crossover. So Dean and Sam Winchester, the hunky ghoul hunters from Supernatural, are mysteriously transported into the classic Scooby-Doo episode, A Night of Fright is No Delight. It's a haunted TV or something. Not wanting to spoil the innocence of the Scooby-Doo world with their knowledge of demons and the supernatural, Dean and Sam try to tag along and play out the story of the episode while trying to figure out why they're there. What really sold me on this crossover was just the immediate acknowledgement of this show's difference in realism. Yes, the Scooby gang doesn't normally go up against the supernatural, natural that's not real enough for their world but in a way supernatural is a more realistic world scooby and the gang are on their way to a castle that scooby is set to possibly inherit because of his heroism trying to make small talk sam and dean ask about this guy's death to which fred responds but he's dead now right uh yeah that cancer 
of course, Scooby-Doo is more realistic in its approach to monsters, but this is a level of realism they would never do in Scooby-Doo because it's a kid's show. It's so hilariously out of place. Dean loves Scooby-Doo, but he doesn't love Fred, so he has a rivalry with him that Fred is just completely oblivious to. Let's do this. Dean just fumbles against Fred in a drag race. It should have been so easy with his Impala, but he just slipped it up. The rivalry is only accentuated by Dean's affection for Daphne. Speaking of accentuated, I don't think she's ever been drawn that way. I mean, drawn that way. Sam pretends he doesn't really know what Scooby-Doo is and has a problem with Dean flirting with Daphne. She's clearly with Fred. It's not clear, Sam. It's just not. But he totally knows what Scooby-Doo is. Velma is obsessed with him, especially his shoulders. She's trying to do this whole thing where she playfully teases him about believing in real monsters, but he's been hunting them for like 13 years now. He does not have the patience to playfully flirt with her. So if you could keep those giant linebacker shoulders from knocking over any clues, that would be great. Why do you keep talking about my shoulders? fumbling the bag, Sam. Shaggy and Scooby hang out with Castiel. I know nothing about this guy, but I know a lot about Shaggy and Scooby-Doo, so he's all right. He thanks them for their profound wisdom, their like Hakuna Matata way of life. I'll miss your wise words and your gentle spirits. <laughs> like we will miss breathing. <laughs> no worries, man. <laughs> I also love when the gang has a very real breakdown when the supernatural has presented itself to them beyond superstition. Been stopping real estate developers when we could have been hunting Dracula? If there are ghosts, that means there's an afterlife. Heaven, hell. Am I going to hell? Overall, it's a great fan-pleasing episode. The characters come together very well, and it's a super fun, dark Scooby-Doo project. Next, from 2019, OKKO OK Monster Party. OKKO OK is not a show I've seen too much of. I've seen a few episodes, and I do really love its celebration of, like, 90s and early 2000s anime and, like, American action cartoons. The way all of the characters say sorry, as if it's a Canadian dub production of an anime, is just very charming. And in a loving tribute to the casual nature of Scooby-Doo crossovers and other shows like it, OKKO OK also has a very fluid crossover sort of vibe. There's an episode where they cross over with Sonic the Hedgehog. We find out one of the main characters in the show, Enid, who has a history in the show of being shameful of her past as a witch, used to attend the ghoul school. Her parents are a werewolf and a vampire, so it's such a fun, fitting moment in the show. The ghoul school is the primary location of the Scooby-Doo movie, Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School, in which Shaggy, Scooby, and Scrappy become instructors at a school for all of the famous monster's daughters. Seeing most of these ghoul school gals with most of the original voices back in the OK KO animation style was really great. I think the overall energy of the episode and the show vibes really well with the really colorful, goofy monsters of the early Scooby TV movies, which I've covered in a video. Phantasma, Elsa Frankenteen, Sabella, the mummy who's like no longer a baby. She's grown up. The ghoul school walked so Monster High could run. There's also a moment where we get a flashback where we get to see what Enid would have looked like in the old movie. Brad, a character in OKKO, OK performs his own version of the scrappy rap. That's a deep cut. Makes it a 10 out of 10 in my book. And finally, most recently, we got a crossover with Teen Titans Go. This show gets a lot of hate, and I do understand criticism for every single property being fitted to appeal to every single age group and every demographic and every style and every genre can be a really annoying thing, and I think criticism about just using franchise titles in that way is justifiably deserved, but I think all of the way that hate gets channeled into this one show is so silly. I mean, if you don't like this version of the Teen Titans Young Justice, got a few more seasons, they did that edgy live action show, I know a lot of people hate that, but there's also all of the straight to home video movies they've done with the Teen Titans over the years. There's so much media starring these characters, why do you have to overlook every Everything that is designed to appeal to you to hate on this one thing. So in this episode, the media-obsessed control freak summons the Teen Titans to go to a high-stakes interdimensional game of family feud against what he sees as a better show, the Scooby-Doo Gang. 
If he wins, the Teen Titans will be canceled once and for all. A very meta look at like the way people see this show. And the Teen Titans have trouble stating their show is better than Scooby-Doo's. But there's quite a few funny moments in this episode. There's also this one random deserved Frank Welker tribute where Cyborg shares the reason why he appreciates Scooby-Doo is because of the voice work of Frank Welker. Why is the Scooby gang so much more entertaining and funny and all around better than those lame, stupid, dumb dumb the Teen Titans. Because of versatile voice actor Frank Welker. He's been Fred for over 50 years. And in like the past 15 years, he's also taken over the role of Scooby-Doo. Talent. The Beast Boy likes Scooby Snacks. If that makes you mad, f you. It's a silly time. And now we get to the miscellaneous slayer. This is where you stop watching if you are scared. This is some of the most obscure Scooby-Doo media. If cartoons that haven't been seen by a lot of people scare you, get away. So first, we have Scooby's All-Star Laugh Olympics. This show is bullshit. It's sort of like the spiritual successor of wacky races, but instead of just like racing, there's all of these silly sporting events, all of the Hanna-Barbera characters compete in. Instead of like different countries, there's three bigger teams. There's the Yogi Yahooies, the Scooby Doobies, and the Really Rottens. Now, instead of getting Dick Dastardly from Wacky Races back, uh, there apparently were some rights issues. So they had to create two new characters to be like a part of the villains team, there's the Dread Baron and the Mumbly. What do you have to say about your win? Some pheasant winning fuzzle rotten. Instead of Dick Dastardly and Muttley? Like, what? Daisy Mayhem's an original character for the Really Rottens. Also, I want to be on Team Really Rotten. So these are like just a bunch of silly little sketches with the Hanna-Barbera characters and characters that aren't on like a team officially often have like guest roles on the sidelines as they commentate on things like Fred and Barney are like titled guest stars in one episode and they just sort of are like, well, Barn, yeah. And then they're gone. Like Scooby-Doo and Fred Flintstone don't talk to each other once. Snagglepuss and this like other character I've never seen before are the hosts. This is like a really great 101 course if you really want to know the whole Hanna-Barbera gang. But this is probably the worst show in the whole video. I'm sure some of you have like nostalgia for it. Get over it. <laughs> Says the man in the Scooby-Doo hat. Next, we have like a lot of random cameos Scooby and the gang have in a bunch of different things. Scooby shows up in Billy and Mandy. The Roadrunner shows up in one episode of What's New Scooby-Doo. Shaggy tells actor Matthew Lillard off in Looney Tunes back in action. I was, just, I was trying to be real to your character. If you like goof on me in the sequel, I'm coming after you. Yeah, and I'll give you a Scooby smile. Sabrina the Teenage Witch talks to Shaggy and Scooby, who are her screensavers. Velma appears in the Lego movie too. In reference to the meme, Shaggy beats up Scorpion in this Mortal Kombat intro. And of course, Scooby-Doo characters are featured in both Lego dimensions and multiverses. There was a long line of Scooby-Doo comics called Scooby-Doo Team Up, which also featured a lot of crossovers. And there are a few Scooby-Doo Scooby-Doo parodies that feature the official voice actors reprising the role. Robot Chicken has Matthew Lillard as Shaggy. And Mad, the animated sketch comedy show from Mad Magazine and Cartoon Network has a silly parody called Downton Shaggy. I like the moment where Shaggy becomes rich and just turns his back on his friends. It's very very silly. And the weirdest thing about this little sketch is they got most of the Scooby-Doo cast. They're missing Kate Micucci's Velma. But for some reason, despite that, Daphne's the one who doesn't talk? Gray Griffin fills in for Kate Micucci with Velma? I should really stop saying jinkies because it does not mean what I think it does. Which makes it a unique oddity in Scooby-Doo's lore. During the mid nineties, there was this like drought of Scooby-Doo content, which ended with Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. But right after Turner Broadcasting purchased Hanna-Barbera's catalog, they made this weird special called Scooby-Doo in Arabian Nights, which like Bugs Bunny's 1001 Rabbit's Tales features Shaggy and Scooby telling Arabian Nights tales to like a prince. There's not that many segments with Scooby and Shaggy, but what I think is notable about this and like Scooby's lore, it features like adult character designs modeled after the pup named Scooby-Doo character models. 
So that's sort of neat. And finally, <gasps> it's scary. Night of the Living Do. This was a Scooby-Doo TV special making fun of the new Scooby-Doo movies starring Gary Coleman and David Cross alongside the Scooby-Doo cast. This special hasn't been seen much since it aired in 2001 and features a tongue-in-cheek look at Scooby and the gang. Alongside the Johnny Bravo crossover of the live action movie and the Scooby-Doo project, which I will talk about maybe next year. This was a part of a whole line of Scooby-Doo media that came out like at the turn of the millennium that was just about Warner Brothers experimenting what to do with the IP. There's a monster in David Cross's castle and Jabberjaw's behind it all. I've been watching a lot of Mr. Show recently, so seeing David Cross here, I kind of gaslit myself that Bob Odenkirk was also in this, but he's not. Oh, hey, Mr. Shifty. Have you seen Gary Coleman? Mr. Shifty? Who is this Mr. Shifty? I am a zombie coming to eat your brains. <laughs> And finally, most recently, we have Scooby-Doo in Where Are They Now? A made-for-TV special that is a sort of parody of behind-the-scenes reunion specials, all made for the 50th anniversary of Scooby-Doo. The actors who play the mystery gang, because they don't actually solve mysteries, are invited to the Warner Brothers lot for this reunion special, after which they're told there's a real mystery for them to solve. There's a lot of silly, like, show business humor in this. Some of it doesn't land, and some of it really lands. Like, they interview a lot of the fake crew members who used to work on the show. But they also interview a lot of the voice actors, so they do break the fourth wall to allow there to be some worthwhile content. I really love the moment where it's revealed that Scooby-Doo is actually a classically trained actor, and it's actually taken him a lot of training to get the Scooby voice down. That's where I come in. Yikes. See, my job was to help him Yikes. unlearn Yikes. just enough English that he could legitimately pass for a great Dane. Look at me, look at me. Yikes! Yikes! Let's get- Yikes! Yikes! I had to drill it line by line, day by day, taking it very slowly until he got it just right. Yikes! Yikes, yikes, so yikes! He really, really found the essence of this character. There's also cameos from a slew of different Hanna-Barbera characters talking about the Scooby gang and their success like their celebrities. Even the Powerpuff Girls. The person behind it all is the supposed sixth member of the gang who was cut before the show ever got to air. <laughs> a little fake story. This one's only weird because I had never heard of it. I was so into Scooby-Doo that I was missing Scooby-Doo news. I do love the sad unmasking montage from this special as well. It's, it's very silly. So that was it. That was the Scooby-Doo crossover iceberg. I've had a lot of fun of doing this one. It was a little bit more of a relaxed experience than my previous Scooby-Doo marathon. You know, the pandemic, and I was also like in the middle of a move during all of it. So it was fun to visit Scooby-Doo when I wasn't super stressed and tired. Visiting Scooby-Doo from this angle, I've gotten to view things from Scooby-Doo's entire history. And in doing that, it's pretty easy to see why Scooby-Doo is a show and property that persists. It's never going to be the big thing that everybody is into, but everybody's seen it. Scooby-Doo is still popular today because it was created to be a contrast to all of the superhero action shows that Hanna-Barbera and other studios were making at the time for kids. And in 50 years, the popularity of that stuff has persisted. And so has Scooby-Doo in a way as an institutional piece of contrarianism, except for Scoob that tried to do what everyone else was doing, but he's allowed to once in a while. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Columbo recently. One episode. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter Falk played Columbo until he died. Who done it? Mysteries are always going to be appealing. And Scooby-Doo, he's a cartoon. <laughs> he's not going anywhere. And neither am I. See ya.